On May 11, 1935, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed an executive order for the establishment of the Rural Electrification Administration, bringing power to rural America. While the Rural Electrification Administration, or REA, brought opportunity, turning that opportunity into a reality wasn't easy, as was the case in Southwest Missouri. After reading about the REA in the newspaper, country store owner J.B. Sims went to see the local McDonald County Extension agent. Together, they set up meetings anywhere they could and went from farm to farm looking for those willing to sign on with the REA at a cost of $5. They came up with 100 in in rural McDonald County willing to be part of Carroll Electric Cooperative from Northwest Arkansas. Meanwhile, the Newton County Extension agent, Frank Darnell, after attending the annual meeting of Ozark Electric Cooperative in Mount Vernon, was convinced Newton County farmers ought to join the neighboring co-op to the east. So he set up a pair of meetings at the Newton County Courthouse. At the second of these meetings, REA Representative E.E. E. Carnes told the Newton County farmers that if they they got together with their McDonald County neighbors, they had enough resources to build a fine co-op. So they did, and 505 willing participants from Newton and McDonald counties became Numac Electric Cooperative. Articles of Incorporation were filed with the Secretary of State on May 10, 1939. And of the 12 signers of Numac Electric's Articles of Incorporation, nine, including Sims, were elected to the co-op's first board of directors. They opened up an office over the First National Bank on the Neosho Square, and on June 14, 1939, papers were signed for an REA loan of $288,000 to build 318 miles of line. On Valentine's Day, 1940, Lester B. Pittman became the first to receive power from the new co-op, and within three years, more than a thousand members were receiving power from Numac Electric Cooperative. As the co-op grew, the offices would move from upstairs of the bank to a block south of the Neosho Square at 108 East Hickory. Then in 1959, Numac moved its headquarters to a new building located on Highway 86 on the western edge of town. At that time, the co-op was serving nearly 6,000 members. Soon after moving into the new building, Numac hired a young man for the engineering department who would serve in many roles before becoming the co-op's fifth general manager. I was with the engineering department and uh, uh, Lee Cohen and I went up there to stake that line and it had never been a line there and this was, you know, back only in the 60s. Never been an electric line there down that road. And uh, we topped the hill and looked down there that house was. And we went ahead and staked it, and we got down there, and uh, uh, first this older man came out and talked to us, and I thought he was probably the, the head of the house, you know, and come found out he was the son of the old lady that come out after that. And uh, their uh, their dad, or their, her, her husband, had passed away, and uh, she told me, she said he, he never wanted that newfangled electricity at his house. But he's dead and gone now, and we're going to have electricity. On October 28, 1965, Numac Electric Cooperative held its 26th annual meeting. Among those elected to serve on the board that year was a young man named Virgil Winchester, and he's been serving ever since. I've enjoyed every minute of it. I have. I've, 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 I've enjoyed just everything about it. The people, uh, they even call me, everybody's been pretty nice about everything and, and like I say, uh, we, we, we've got a better system now of uh, taking care of people. I don't have near the gripes that I did have back then. It's just been, it's just a, a big improvement. In 1972, Martin Youngblood was elected to the board. When I first come on the board, uh, there was a lot of old men on there, and uh, I was probably the youngest one to ever come on the board. And I, I didn't have too much to say, but I'd done a lot of listening. With the co-op into its second and third generation of members, that was also the case with the men who served them. I've been here starting my 33rd year. Uh, my dad was out here 33 years when he retired. and. Uh, I had three uncles and a grandpa that's been working here. 
back in the early 40s or late 40s to early 50s. So we've got a big part of the 75 years of the co-op. Starting Christmas Day 1987, the cooperative was hit with the most damaging ice storm in its history with around 5,000 outages, some lasting as long as 13 days. One of the things I remember uh, distinctly was the first ice storm I went through. It was in 1987 and uh, I was overwhelmed at first. I couldn't believe how much everything was tore up. Uh, I remember it was a mess. It happened on Christmas Day. I remember that. It was one of those outages when you got out there you thought it would never end. The 1987 ice storm is when I was working as a part-time dispatcher on the weekends. Power lines were down everywhere. Roads were horrible. And uh, it was just a mess. Trees down, you name it. And we worked day and night to get that back on. I actually went out in the field and helped with crews. That time it was the National Guard. Me and Raymond Wilson went out and was leading National Guard so they could hook up generators for the poultry operations. Very near the end of the ice storm is when they, uh, the CEO at the time, Bill Chabot, came to me and uh, hired me full time. And since that time, uh, it's almost been 27 years now. We thought it was a major ice storm, and it was for that time. Uh, compared to the 2007 ice storms, it was minor. <laughs> in 1994, with the cooperative approaching 13,000 customers along 2,500 miles of line, the time had come to add a second office. In April of that year, the doors were opened to a newly constructed district office in Anderson. We were looking where the growth was at the time and trying to come up and see about how long it was for people to have to drive to the office. We actually opened that office, uh, I believe our grand opening was April 18th, 1994, I believe. Uh, that was the day we opened it up for business. And uh, it's been busy ever since. We have a good steady flow of people coming through there. In June of 1997, having outgrown the facilities of the last 38 years, Numac Electric moved into its current headquarters, built just across the field to the east along Highway 86. After three years on the job as assistant manager, in 1998, former accountant Mitch McCumber took over as general manager of Numac Electric. The board made it very clear uh, when I was hired that over and above everything else, the first thing that we would always address as Numac Electric would be safety. The second thing that we would always address is these customers, these members, are always going to have it right. And uh, I think that was a, a, a real clear message they sent me and, and was, was always my marching orders that that was the way it was going to be. As the 21st century rolled in, Numac Electric was receiving record growth helped significantly by the development of Highway 71 through McDonald County. Major retailers and restaurants began moving into Numac territory. I think that development of that highway coming through here is going to, from a historical perspective, be one of the biggest things economically that ever happened to the co-op. Numac was also benefiting from technological advancements such as meters that automatically reported readings to the co-op. When I first started working, people sent in their readings. So you would, you would key in a payment, you would key in a reading. And so if they were paying late, they were sending in payments, readings late. Technology, has saved the consumers a lot of money. It saved it in man hours. It's, uh, we have our outage management system that you can, you know, instead of a pen and paper, we now can key them in, keep track of who's out. Then came 2007 and the worst ice storm that Numac had ever experienced. In January, two installments of ice two days apart caused as many as 14,400 of Numac's nearly 17,000 customers to be out of power. Twelve days later, with the workforce including 20 assisting companies from 11 states, power was completely restored. I, I recall one of my linemen coming in and saying, I don't, I, I, I'm at a loss. I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do, you know, because everything was down. Then, 11 months later, Numac received another ice storm in December. This time, around 5,000 customers were affected for four days. 
Five months after the second bout of ice was a truly tragic storm. On May 10, 2008, a mile-wide EF4 tornado ripped through Newton County, killing 14, mostly around the community of Racine. Over the next four days, Numac restored power to 9,000 customers and worked to replace 400 broken poles. Pretty much total devastation. That tornado uh, basically hopscotched all the way across Newton County. We had damage, not only severe damage in the Racine area, but even on over north of Neosho and clear on over uh, by Wheaton and that area over there. So I only worked about three miles of it. And, uh, I, it would have been as bad as the one in Joplin had it been that populated. But, uh, it was a bad deal. Three years later, on May 22, 2011, Newmac was impacted by the Joplin tornado, one of the deadliest in our nation's history, killing 161 people. While tragically the worst damage occurred inside the city limits, Newmac had 4,000 customers out of power near Joplin and in McDonald County, which also received tornadic winds. That was the worst I'd ever seen if anywhere I'd been around working. We went up there one day to help clean up and uh, just unbelievable. While the storms have been memorable, it's been those working to serve the membership who have defined New Mac Electric Cooperative. The customers are number one for us here and without them we wouldn't be in business. So we've got to provide them with the best possible service at the lowest possible price. We're there for our membership. We're trying to take care of the needs of our membership and we're trying to listen to what they want. I think for, for the most part, people, uh, they like what they're seeing at Newmake. I always believed that a person ought to feel good about his work. And I felt good about my work. Whatever I did, I looked forward to it. I looked, when I got up in the morning, I was ready to go to Newmac. I spent 37 years at Newmac, almost half of what uh, the 75th uh, anniversary will be, I spent at Newmac and I, I developed a lot of good, close relationships with uh, a lot of good people and I'll always remember that. It's been a great place to work and it's just got a lot of good people here and I'm sure that uh, someday I will look back at it as probably one of the best career moves I ever made and I honestly believe that there's a good group of people that we've been bringing on that will be able to carry this legacy even into the future. The opportunity to work at Newmac Electric has been one of the greatest things that I've ever had in my life. The opportunity to work with a board of directors uh, that regardless of what the faces are on that board have always looked out for the membership. Um, to work with an employee base that's a lot more like family than employees. And to be able to work with these members that we've got, um, I want to tell you, I've always been, treat been treated nothing but good by the folks that buy their electricity from New Mac Electric. And it's been just a very rewarding experience to me and my family um, to be able to have this job at New Mac. When I went to work here, um, I hard in and I didn't even know I forgot to even ask the manager what I was going to be making per hour. I was so excited about it. And, and I went to work, have enjoyed it, and I'd like to say thank you to, to New Mac. We've got people that's got electricity that would have never had it if we hadn't been for the, the New Mac Electric.